Jaron Lanier is truly a Renaissance man. Computer scientist, composer, artist, and author, he's a pioneer in virtual reality, a term that incidentally he coined. Jaron Lanier is also a musician and composer, active in the world of new classical music. A specialist in unusual and historical musical instruments, he maintains one of the largest and most varied collections of actively played instruments in the world. And he will play for us tonight, and as a very special treat, the famed flutist, composer, improviser, Robert Dick is here. He will play with Jaron Lanier, so it's really a treat, and we are just delighted. Thank you, Robert, for being here. You Are Not a Gadget, a Manifesto, Jaron Lanier's first book, sparked controversy in its demand that we shape technology to fit culture's needs rather than allowing technology to shape us. Jaron Lanier is here tonight with his new book, Who Owns the Future?, which reveals why our information economy is failing and how to revive it. Please join me in welcoming Jaron Lanier to the JCCSF. Thank you, thank you so much for coming out. I'm going to start with a little bit of music, and then we'll get into this, the, uh, the serious stuff. And then a little bit more music after that. <laughs> So now when I, when I step over here, I'm a writer. This is the, the author position, that's the musician position. So that was a can, it's from Laos. Um, it's, uh, it's a cool instrument because it's, ar it's arguably the first uh, digital uh, device in human history. They go back uh, tens of thousands of years and it's a parallel sequence of similar objects that are turned off or on in a combinatorial fashion. So this is the first digital number. Um. So. We often think of our technical culture, our technical civilization as being counterposed against a sense of faith or the faith-based aspect of our culture. But actually to be technical is to exercise a kind of faith that progress will happen, right? You do an experiment and you just have this faith that somehow you can gain a better understanding or greater ability than you had before. And somehow reality keeps on yielding to this faith and giving us the next step and the next step and the next step. It's really quite a remarkable thing, you know? <laughs> and I have noticed an interesting tension lately between that sense of faith, which I view as being incredibly optimistic, this idea that if you want to understand the world better or if you want to understand how to make better technology, that that will be possible provided you try that's been counterposed against a different idea of optimism that <laughs> what we already know is fantastic and perfect and we shouldn't be questioning it. 
And the reason I'm bringing up that contrast is that I feel my own field, my own world has been infected by what I view as a kind of an inferior kind of optimism, which is a kind of a complacent optimism. It's a complacent sense that we already know what digital ideals should be, that we already know everything we need to know about what digital perfection is. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about an ideology that's really become pretty dominant in my field. It's an ideology that um, the world is becoming more and more digital, more and more into a technology that will be run by computers, that will be like a computer, will become more like computers, um, in the more extreme versions will eventually become immortal because we'll be uploaded into a computer. Uh, <laughs> and that in this world, there's a sort of um, a meaning to life or direction to reality, which is to make the world more and more optimal. And to make the, more and more, the world more and more optimal, you make the information that drives computers more and more available to those computers. So this is an ideology that I kind of helped create when I was younger. It manifests in many forms. It manifests in the pirate parties and in the open source movement, and it manifests in hacker culture and in WikiLeaks type politics, and it manifests in um, in the extremes in the singularity movement, which is essentially a new religion, the one in which we'll become immortal because we'll be uploaded into the machines. And that particular extreme version is very mainstream. I mean, the, some of the top people at Google, Google talk about it all the time as, as their ideal. So as I was part of this ideal, I was part of this idealistic community for years. And I looked forward tremendously to the benefits that I thought would come about when the digital networks we were building were finally made available to everyone. What I expected seemed entirely reasonable, what we all expected. We thought that if we made information free and made it universally available, what would happen is that it would cause a massive blooming of efficiencies and creativity uh, that good ideas would spread and mingle and multiply. We thought it would be another experience for mankind that recalled what had happened before when new technologies came about that just changed the ground rules for people. If we think back on plumbing or highways or decent fertilizers or vaccines or electricity in the wall, in all these examples, when these things happened, there was a wave of well-being. There were decreases in infant mortality, increases in life expectancy. There were increases in levels of education because people were able to have the ease and the latitude to become educated. We thought we were doing something similar. So imagine my surprise when networking finally became good enough to become ubiquitously available in the last, oh, I don't know, 15 years or so? Maybe no more than that now. I didn't see that happening. Um, instead, we've seen a rather different phenomenon. We've entered into a period with a seemingly unbounded and uncontrollable increase in income concentration. We've seen a decrease in social mobility. We've seen one big financial scandal after another. And these financial scandals seem to have a way of pulling down whole governments into um, dysfunction. Europe enduring a wave of austerity. America uh, l losing its credit rating. <laughs> you know, all these crazy things. Um, we see jobless recoveries. We see a hollowed out job market. We're seeing a world that's really not responding with this wave of wealth and well-being that it was supposed to respond with. So getting back to where I opened about this faith that you have as a technologist or as a scientist, that if you ask questions, if you do the work, you'll learn more 
that the next step will be available to you. It seems to me that it's time for us to look at our ideals and to say something is not working. I find in my world, though, that what used to be the ideas of kids, we were children when we started a lot of these things, um, that these ideals have become orthodoxies. And it's very hard now to challenge some of the ingrained ideas. Um, that's a shame, because we must learn to challenge them. And so that's what I'm undertaking in the new book, Who Owns the Future? What I noticed starting around the turn of the century was that there were these new centers of intense power and influence that were rising up, particularly in the business world and in finance, that were concentrating income and influence at fantastic rates. And if you looked very closely at these institutions, if you cracked open the egg, what you would find inside is a giant computer. Now, let me give you an example of some of these. Let us suppose that you're an American health insurance company. So it used to be, before networking became ubiquitous and computing became cheap, that the actuaries, the statisticians who would set the prices for insurance, could only work very approximately. All they could do was guess roughly at what the ideal price would be on a very broad statistical basis. But once there was, there was a huge influx of big data and it was possible to have huge computers to process it, a big insurance company, without necessarily intending to be evil at all, just as a matter of course, turned into an entirely different type of organization. Now suddenly, the temptation was overwhelming to try to calculate precisely who really needed insurance and who didn't, and to insure those who didn't need it, right? And that's precisely the problem with the American healthcare system. It's possible for people with the big computers to calculate their decision so as to make everyone else take the risk, and, to, and they attempt just naturally because of their ability to attempt to create the perfect business, a business that's not really a business anymore. It's not a business that uses some local insight in order to try to manage their risk, which is what a traditional business is. Instead, it's an entity that tries to use a global processing of the world to avoid risk entirely. <laughs> it's a new sort of venture in human affairs. Now, this is what I call in the book a siren server. Some of the siren servers appeared with insurance companies. Um, in fact, I'll tell you a story which uh, the editors wouldn't allow me to keep in the book. I once, <laughs> I, I once had a gig consulting to the CEO of the largest American insurer. And I won't tell you the year because that would reveal who it is. So you, I don't think you can figure it out. But we had a retreat on an island in the San Juans to talk about how to use computation to improve the business. And the guy was saying, you know, with this big computer, if somebody's going to get sick, I don't have to insure them. Wow, this is amazing. Our business can grow. It could be incredible. And just at that moment, there was this huge whooshing sound and then like this little earthquake and this enormous boom. And it turns out there'd been a meteor strike right on this island. <laughs> and so. It was just, I'd never been at a meteor strike before. It's, it's a really weird feeling, you know? And anyway, so those of you who are astronomers who wish to study meteors, I recommend you find an insurance company executive and use them as bait, and then you can reliably uh, gather the data you need. Um, so the insurance companies aren't the only example. Uh, we can also talk about the giant financial schemes, the, the leverage bundle derivative hedgy schemes. We can talk about the high frequency trading schemes. We can also talk about the new natures of the national intelligence agencies. We can also talk about the Googles and the Facebooks and the other Silicon Valley online companies. We can talk about all kinds of different entities uh, giant stores, the Amazons and the Walmarts. All of these centers of power use giant computers to calculate their way to attempted perfection. Now, 
there's a metaphor I like to make with an imaginary creature called Maxwell's demon. How many of you have met Maxwell's demon? Not too many. So uh, the demon is a thought experiment used to teach physics, to teach thermodynamics. And the idea of the demon is that it's operating a little tiny door between two chambers. One, ha they both have fluids, um, air, water, something, and, and the, the demon is watching the molecules that come close to the door, and it lets hot molecules go from left to right. It opens the door for them, and it lets cold molecules go in the other direction. And if it just keeps on opening the door carefully, over time it separates the hot and the cold, and then it can open a bigger door and let them mix again and run a turbine, and then keep on repeating this, and you get a perpetual motion machine. It's magic, right? But it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is that information is actually effort. It's actually work. Opening the door requires power. Measuring the molecules requires power. It requires computer memory to store your memory of where the particle was so you can tell if it's hot or cold. All of this adds up, and you end up needing more power to run the scheme, and you radiate more waste heat than you can benefit from. So there's no free lunch. And the thing is, with, when you have a giant computer connected to an open network and you're running a business, you fall into this illusion that you can be Maxwell's demon and really make it work. When an insurance company is separating the people who need insurance from the people who don't need insurance, it's just like Maxwell's demon trying to separate the hot molecules from the cold molecules and imagining that there's a perpetual motion machine or a perfect business. This happens again and again and again, and it never works. There is no free lunch. You can't make a perfect business, but you always want to try when you happen to have the biggest computer. Back when I was younger, um, and we imagined that just getting, letting information flow around as freely as possible would be the best way to foster fairness and creativity and all of these good things, we failed to take something into consideration. Let's say you want to create a utopia where everybody's sharing information openly. Well, it might be the case, and I think it is the case, that people are created equal. Everybody has something to offer. There's more creativity and brilliance out there than we usually realize. However, computers are not created equal. Whoever has the biggest computer in an open network well, as a matter of course, even without any evil intent, even without any nefarious scheme, as a matter of course, they'll naturally be tempted into turning into a Maxwell's demon wannabe. It's happened again and again and again. It happened with insurance. It happened with finance. What we had, what, finance has grown enormously. It's, it's, uh, multiplied its, its uh, portion of the, its place in the economy since computing got big. But what's happened is repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly financiers attempt to create a perfect scheme with a big computer and then it fails. It happened first with, uh, you might recall some events around long-term capital and Enron and then more recently the events of the Great Recession with bundled mortgages and other, other uh, horrible securities. And now it's happening again with student debt and in many other ways. It'll just keep on happening and happening and happening because it's the same illusion over and over again. You try to create a scheme in which you don't take risk, you pass it off on everyone else, but there isn't some infinitely big world to absorb all that risk. What ends up happening is you damage the world in which your own wealth makes sense. So rather, you do concentrate wealth, but you damage the basis of your wealth, so you're not even serving your own interest. And yet the immediate temptation is so great that people in the position of having one of the biggest computers fall into the illusion again and again and again. So what happens when you have the biggest computer is you want more than anything else to get information about other people so that you can calculate correlations and little predictions in order to make little subtle moves gradually over time that make them take your risks for you. This happens in slightly different ways with the different types of big computers I mentioned, but they're all fundamentally similar. 
I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, with mortgages, the first thing to do is to get people to, inform, to <clears throat> participate with your big computer. So you want to get them into the game as much as possible. So you do that with some kind of a trinket. And as you'll recall, there were insanely easy to get mortgages. Do you remember that? Just yesterday? <laughs> and once you get people in with the trinket, then what you do is you gradually calculate ways that somebody else takes whatever risks or costs that there are instead of you. You do this in a very strange, zen-like, selfless way. When you own one of the biggest computers, you don't ever exercise power directly because with that comes risk. Your goal is to be the master channeler, the hub, but you want to be as ignorant and as un unconnected as possible to anything that actually happens or any decision that's actually made. So you don't know if the bundle derivative is fraudulent or not. How would you know you're just the hub? Similarly, you don't know if that video that's been uploaded is in violation of a copyright. You are just the hub. You don't know if your social network is hosting harassment of a teen who might be on the verge of suicide. You're just the hub. The idea is to pull back and to not do anything except being dominant, okay? Now, the way that you benefit from these things is not by intervening in people's affairs. You don't micromanage because that would interrupt the flow of information, which is your source of wealth. All you have to do is something much simpler, and it takes just a little longer, but it's very reliable. All you have to do is avoid risk and be a player of some kind, and very gradually you'll get more and more influential and more and more powerful. So let me give you some examples of how this works. An early pioneer was Walmart, and I had a consulting gig with them too, so I, I got to know it firsthand. Walmart used big computing before its rivals to try to organize its business. It didn't try to manipulate its direct customers, but instead its supply chain, all the people who made raw materials and manufactured and transported them. And what it did is it gathered enough data about everybody in the loop that it could predict what everyone's bottom lines really were and therefore negoti negotiate everyone right down to the bone. And that hadn't happened before. You have to understand that in the history of markets, the idea has always been that each player in a market has limited information. So it's like a whole bunch of different, um, the market is made of all these different uh, uh, players, each of whom has a different theory about reality and they compete with each other. But when you have the biggest computer and information is flowing around for free, it's what I call the local global flip. You're no longer a local player, you're a global planner because you can outcompute everybody. So Walmart knew more about people than they knew about themselves. Walmart knew more about the bottom lines that people could accept than they themselves knew. And as a result of that, they slammed everyone else's margins down to the very limit. The whole supply chain be, had to organize itself to Walmart's benefit just to stay in the game. By the time their competitors understood it and got their own big computers, it was too late because everyone was locked into a flow that was optimized for Walmart. This is called the network effect or stickiness in the trade. It's our favorite thing in Silicon Valley. So Walmart accomplished a lot of good in my view. It managed the rise of, Ch of China to a degree from a US perspective. It created a better, smoother business option and probably made for a more peaceful and less risky world. So I don't think that everything that happens with siren servers is necessarily horrible just as they're not formed out of bad intent at the start, they don't necessarily create universally horrible results, especially in the short term. But in the long term, Walmart limits its own success by impoverishing its own customers. Because in order to make the whole world be slammed down to bare minimums of margin and lowering costs everywhere, its own customers have less to spend on its products. It concentrates wealth by shrinking the overall market and the overall economy instead of by growing it. And this is something that you'll see universally with all the siren servers. The free internet empires of Silicon Valley like Google and Facebook and Twitter and all the rest function on a similar principle. 
just as with the cheap mortgages or the cheap prices at Walmart, there's an initial treat that's dangled in front of people to bring them on board so that their information flows and they enter into an information lock-in relationship of some kind with the giant computers. The price that's paid in the long term is subtle. In order for Google to do what it does, or any of these, I shouldn't pick on Google, it's true for all the companies. Um, what all of us do, and I, I'm totally not talking about some remote alien them that I'm criticizing like a, like a smart aleck lefty critic or something, I'm totally part of this. Um, a startup that I, I help create is part of Google now. I'm, I'm totally part of this world. I'm speaking to myself and my friends. So the way the business works is the people who use your service for free are, as is often said and correctly, not the customers. You are not Google's customer. You are the product, right? Because the people who are the customers are the ones who pay Google to micromanage the options that are placed in front of you, the links that you see before other links. That's the business. It's not advertising properly because it's not really an active communication or a romanticization of a product. It's just micromanaging the options. Now, in order for that business to work, information about you needs to be gathered so that a behavioral model of you can be created through the correlations. Now, this is, <laughs> this is a strange thing. Um, individually, people are not all that predictable, I think, but collectively we are it's for the simple reason that statistics is a valid branch of mathematics, right? So you c if you have enough data about people, you can start to, on average, predict individuals. You can start to say, wow, if I stuck this link in front of that person, they're likely to click on it and they'll buy this thing. So you start to gain an ability to manipulate people. You start to gain an ability to be a central planner about people's lives in just the way that Walmart was able to manipulate the supply chain to its stores in an earlier decade. And all of us happily accept this because we love these trinkets. So we date people recommended by these big computers and we listen to music that's assembled by the big computers and all of this. One thing that's interesting about it though <laughs> is that from a scientific point of view, it doesn't actually matter if the algorithms work. And this is a weird thing that can trip you up if you're new to the game. When social scientists or psychologists study the algorithms and dating sites, they universally have found that they don't work. <laughs> and yet, just because people are so drawn in to the web of the biggest computers, since we're at a JCC, I guess I could use JData as an example, um, just the logistics of it makes it work. It's where people go, so you meet people, and then it seems as though the algorithms work. In order to offer these free services, you have to get the data from people for free or otherwise it wouldn't be affordable. So for example, it's important for musicians not to get paid directly because observing what music people listen to is a great source of data for correlating them to the behavior of others and building a model of their character. Um, now this process will continue in a way that will eventually eat your job and your future livelihood. And this is what might not be apparent at first. So I, I want to try to explain how this works. An example that I have found to be a good entry point for this principle is automatic translation. So you can upload a document in English and get it back in Spanish or in other languages now from a variety of big computers, like the ones operated by Google or Microsoft. And the language with which we speak about this service creates an illusion that there's some big artificial brain that, and you're gaining this tremendous advantage because you have free access to this amazing artificial brain that's doing this thing for you. But that's actually not what's happening. That's a phony way of understanding the situation. What actually happens is that enormous numbers of pre-existing translations are gathered and are continuously being gathered over and over again as people continue to translate documents. And these pre-existing examples 
are correlated with your new text, patterns are found, and then a patchwork is made, a mashup is made, where successful earlier translations are patched together to create a new translation. So the point is, these so-called smart algorithms are always, always mashups of work by real people. Real people are behind the curtain, but because of the language we use in which we like to imagine that computers are turning into intelligent creatures on their own, we pretend those people aren't there. Now this is a really interesting sleight of hand. It started early, I, I, one of my dear mentors when I was younger was Marvin Minsky, who's one of the founders of the artificial intelligence movement. And in the late 50s, shortly after the term was made up at a conference at Dartmouth, he assigned a few grad students the summer project of coming up with the crystalline magic little formula that would translate from English to Spanish or to other languages. Because at the time, it was plausible something like that might be discoverable. But it's turned out it isn't. There isn't an E equals MC squared for natural language translation. Instead, there's big data from real people. But we still hold on to the image as if there were some sort of artificial intelligence that could do it on its own. Now, of course, the problem with that is that in order to create the illusion that there's this big brain that's translating, we have to make the people who did the real work of the original translations, the examples, we call them the corpora, um, we have to make them not exist. We have to pretend they're not there. So they certainly don't get paid, right? If we had to pay those people, then the scheme couldn't be uh, free, right? And so essentially artificial intelligence has become a synonym for financial accounting fraud. It's a way of pretending that the people who do work don't exist. Now, I want to put this in a broader historical context. If we go back to the 19th century, you will find a century that was filled with a very public anxiety about whether people would be made obsolete by technologies. Some of the touch points of the 19th century in this regard include the Luddite riots, remember those? Textile workers who were afraid of being made obsolete by improved looms. They rioted, they were hung in the streets. The Ballad of John Henry, one of the few familiar tunes from that century about a guy who's competing with a robot that lays railroad tracks, and he wins only to die from exhaustion. But there's some other streams of culture and thought that originated in precisely this milieu that are completely with us today. One is the left. Marx had his start in the 1840s as a technology writer, a remarkably contemporary sounding technology writer utterly and explicitly motivated by a concern that improving technology would make people obsolete instead of benefiting them. And his motivation for suggesting communism was to have some way for people to benefit when the machines got really good. I really think his solution stinks based on empirical evidence, which I don't think I need to recount to this audience. So, so as, a, as a provider of solutions, he, he's bad. But you know, as a, as a describer of a problem, he's extremely interesting. Uh, Another, another uh, stream of culture that started directly as a result of this anxiety was science fiction. Science fiction is always about whether people will become obsolete. Usually, the idea is that our own machines make us obsolete, and this is uh, the Matrix movies and the Terminator movies and Inception and, and on and on. These things are all replays of the early science fiction of H.G. Wells, The Time Machine, and similar over and over again. The exception is when it's an alien species that makes us obsolete. So that's the War of the Worlds and, and many other variants since then. But it's always about this question about whether people will remain viable and important. Um, now, this fear from the 19th century actually did not turn into a reality in the 20th century. And the reason was that something called the labor movement intervened. And uh, I think we have a labor shop running the show, so hi, labor people, <laughs> hi, union members. I'll try to finish on time, so. Uh, so um, what happened with the unions is that they 
through tremendous struggle, through, through bloodshed, through incredible sustained effort, they made an idea that initially didn't seem reputable, reputable. And that idea was that if there's a new role for human beings, because technology's gotten better, and that role is not as dangerous or filthy or um, unpleasant as the previous role, people could still get paid for performing that new role. So as an example, motorized vehicles replaced horse-drawn vehicles. Now, I love horses. I bet a lot of people in this audience love horses. But dealing with them for work on a daily basis is really hard. There's the hooves and the poop and the feeding and the brushing. And a lot of them have difficult personalities. And it's really hard to deal with horses if you have to. Motorized vehicles are so, so much easier in comparison that you know, you'd think you'd, be, you'd pay to ride one. And indeed, we do. So why would you pay somebody to drive a cab or a truck? It wasn't immediately apparent that that should be the case. So if you ever wonder why is the Teamsters Union kind of ornery, it's because it was a really big fight to get that point across. So this idea that even if the nature of the human role is getting more pleasant as technology improves, that doesn't mean that people shouldn't be paid. That idea was the gift of the labor movement. And that's why the fears of the 19th century were mostly thwarted in the 20th century. And that happy little covenant continued until the turn of the 21st century, when we decided to blow it all to hell with free internet crap. Now, <laughs> um, what we're doing in Silicon Valley now is we're reviving the problems of the 19th century that had been solved. What we're doing is we're saying, if you want to have seemingly automatic translation of texts, the necessary roles for people to make that possible, which is providing the example translations and constant new ones, because language is dynamic, so you don't just do it once. You have to keep on doing it. That role will be unpaid, because it has to be free to make the siren server scheme possible. So we've reverted. Uh, we've unlearned a lesson that was learned at such great cost with the labor movement. We've decided, you know what? <clears throat> If you're not miserable and in danger of being killed by technology, you're not going to get paid. You should be happy. You're getting free services. Just enjoy the informal benefits. You can toot your own horn on social media. You can promote yourself. What do you have to complain about? So we've created this new regime in which um, we've resurrected a character that you might be familiar with named Horatio Alger. Is that familiar to anybody? <laughs> Horatio Alger's stories uh, were tales of a few people, Horatio Alger, who would, uh, the rarefied individuals who would uh, find great success through hard work. But statistically, most people who worked that hard and that diligently and that sincerely did not find success. So they spread false hope, and they were actually cruel. And this is what we're doing now. This is another aspect of the 19th century that we've revived. Only a tiny, tiny number of people will, f will find success through their YouTube videos or their Kickstarter campaigns or any of the rest of it. But a huge multitude of people feel that they're right on the cusp of that success. So they live on hope. And it's a cruel kind of hope because it's statistically phony. It's statistically just as phony as the statistics that are valid that allow Google to predict you. Almost none of them will succeed. It's a, uh, it's a winner-take-all kind of a pattern. We see it again and again. And it, it, it involves lowering the expectations of our young people, which really pisses me off. For instance, uh, how many of you know who Jenna Marbles is? You probably don't. So she's one of the very most successful people on YouTube. She's a gigantic global star, over a billion views. Uh, she's kind of a cross between Snooki and Martha Stewart. She's kind of... Um, Working class girl giving beauty tips, kind of uh, nasty mouth, um, kind of interesting. Anyway, but she's this great success. And the level, she has been able to get enough money to do well on it. Um, she announces that, wow, spectacular success. As the top star on Utah, I can, on YouTube, not Utah. Uh, uh, I can, she rents a $1.1 million home in LA. And she's only 24, 25 now. And 
what I'm thinking is somebody with a billion views, I mean, it's great if you're in your mid-20s and you can afford to rent a million dollar home, but that shouldn't be what the top of the peak looks like. I mean, I, I'd have to pay engineers at any of the big labs a hell of a lot more than that to keep them running these big computers I'm talking about. So it's a kind of a lowered expectation. If that's the peak, then almost everybody is doing way below that. But the thing is, the kind of benefit she has isn't reliable. There's no royalty system. There's nothing like what the unions created for previous generations of content creators. There's no, there's, uh, there's no guarantee at all that she'll have a future. If she gets sick, she has to sing for her supper for every meal. She, she falls off a cliff, just like that. And that's, and <laughs> so, um, and, and there's no guarantee that if she fell to a lower level, then she'd only get a lower level of income. Uh, Google just deigns to support a tiny number of the top people to create the hope. Everyone else falls off the cliff. So what we're doing is we're asking young people to accept benefits of what we call an informal economy, an economy of reputation, an economy of barter, but it's not an economy of wealth creation. It's not an economy that lets you live a normal biological life where you get sick once in a while, you need time to take care of kids, you need to plan to get old. It doesn't do any of that. It's exactly the kind of economy that the developing world is trying to pull itself out of, and yet we're embracing it because we love those cool treats. We love that, that, that little dangled vision of being able to toot our horn on, on social media. Now, one of the great ironies of this is that it didn't have to be so at all. There are alternatives. If there's one thing that just infuriates me, it's people I talk to who say, well, what you're saying is a shame, but just realistically, this is the way it has to be. No other alternative could make any sense. Everything else would be much worse. Well, you don't know that. This is what it, where I come back to, what does optimism mean? My optimism is not that I know what would be better for certain. I'm sure I don't. I'm sure that the alternatives I propose are filled with flaws. All I'm suggesting is that I do have the faith if we, in, if we test ideas like the ones I propose, if we just work at this, we can make it better than it is. That shouldn't be controversial. If that sense that we can do better is lost, if we're so sure that we already know the best way to do things, then that's terribly, terribly sad. So the original idea for networking actually would have avoided this whole set of problems. And this is an amazing bit of lost history. Going back to 1960, before networking actually worked, before the key inventions existed, like packet switching, if you know what that is. A guy named Ted Nelson, who might be, is Ted here tonight? I don't know, he lives here, he lives in, in, in a boat in Sausalito. Excellent. <laughs> so Ted, um, Ted was the first person to articulate how people could use digital networks uh, to collaborate. And he called his idea hypertext, and it's the HT from HTML. He is the source point. And in Ted's scheme, there were universal micropayments that moved around. And how did Ted come to that idea? It's because his parents were Hollywood figures, and they understood what the labor movement had meant to screenwriters and to actors who weren't necessarily stars at every minute. They understood that as machines got better, as life got better, you couldn't force people into an informal economy where they had to sing for their supper for every single meal or fall off a cliff. He got that. What happened is in the decades after Ted's early work, successive generations gradually undid the design until we have what we have today. And those undoings were often Dumb is all I can say, and I was present for them, and I bear some culpability for them. I mean, we didn't know they were dumb, we, but now looking back, I can realize they were moronic. Um, I'll give you a couple of simple examples. Uh, one of Ted's ideas is that if you really have all the computers on a network, you shouldn't ever copy a file. Why? Because it's already there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like simple. Since it's there, if you copy it, you're wasting energy, you're, uh, I mean, at that time, nobody knew about global, global climate change, but um, 
right now, the internet is many, many times larger than it needs to be in order to support file copying, and the carbon footprint is a sin. There's no reason for it, because all this stuff is there, because it's a network. Furthermore, if you make a copy, you lose the original context, so you lose part of the meaning. So not only is it not necessary, but it's a degradation. And of course, if you can make a copy, you can sever the ties to the origin. So if you're copying somebody's translation, by, by copying it and forgetting where it came from, you don't pay the translator. So for all those reasons, he said, copying is stupid. There's no reason for it and every reason not to do it. In the 70s, when I was a teenager, I had the good fortune to spend time at Xerox Park, the formative lab in Palo Alto that invented the way modern computation looks and feels. And this is also the place that had developed Ethernet, the first high quality networking within a building anyway, and Ethernet still runs our Wi-Fi, it's ubiquitous. And yet, in the Xerox Park computers, you could copy files. So I remember when I was there, and I said, why are you copying files? Isn't that moronic? You guys have Ethernet, the, the original's right there. Isn't this the stupidest thing in the whole world? You know how young technical people talk? Like, as soon as you have an insight, everybody else is completely moronic. So, like, this is the stupidest. And they would say, no, no, come over here. Yes, it is the stupidest thing in the world. But our sponsor is Xerox. It's a copying machine company. <laughs> if, we, if we told our sponsors that even in the abstract, the very idea of copying is stupid, why would they fund us? Shut up! <laughs> and <laughs> there were, this is only one example, but there were a variety of weird, quirky, historical circumstances in which the sort of original, pretty clear idea of networking was gradually changed into what we know today, where everything's fragmented, everybody's disconnected from what they do. You never, you know, the, and the benefits accrue to whoever has the biggest computer to process it all. Um, in, in the original design of networking, anybody in a network would know who else was pointing at them. And then we lost the backlinks. We lost the backlinks in the 70s because the young men who were implementing real networking uh, wanted to be able to hide from the government because of the selective service regime or because they wanted to smoke pot or, uh, do you remember CB radio? I don't know. There was this thing where um, a lot of people in the US were upset that President Jimmy Carter had limited the speeds of the, of the nation to 55 miles an hour, so everybody installed these little radios where they'd use fake names to warn each other where the police were. And this thing was gigantic. It was bigger than Twitter in its day. And so this idea of being able to do things without a trace and hide from the government was the ultra cool thing for young technical people. And so for that reason, the backlinks of knowing who was pointing at you became expendable in network design. And that was a horrible loss. If that had been still in place, then you would have known who was leveraging your mortgage, and you could have invested in the scheme that was investing in you. It would have prevented a lot of the over-leveraged mortgage scandal. The idea that people can endlessly bet on remote people without those people knowing it uh, is part of what makes giant computers so unfairly overpowerful versus everybody else. In the book, I draw a comparison on many levels between a leveraged mortgage and a copied music file, because in an economic sense, they're the same thing. And in a technical sense, they're about the same thing, too. It's files copied without a trace for the benefit of whoever has the biggest computer, and to the eventual detriment of the people who, who were copied from, because not because in the immediate sense, in the immediate sense, if somebody leverages your mortgage, you don't feel it. If somebody copies your music file, you don't feel it. But in both cases, your future prospects are gradually being leached away in the service of empowering the biggest computers. So I'm leaving out many chapters of the story and many details. But the bottom line is we've entered into a world where we allow big data to make us crazy because the benefits of it tempt us too much. If you have the biggest computer, without meaning to be a bad guy, you just take advantage of it. You're able to create a perfect scheme. You can, cr you can raise the fastest and biggest fortunes in history just from outcomputing other people. One of the detriments of this is that the incentives to use computing in this way are greater than the incentives to use computing to discern the truth. 
And this is really perhaps the most profound problem, even more profound than the economic inequity. The problem is that, as I pointed out with the automated uh, dating sites, we're used to the idea on some level that the online world is a bit of a confidence game. We all kind of know in our gut that when some service is deciding what music we want to listen to or what movies we want to see or who we want to date or whatever it is, that, you know, maybe it's a bit suspect, but we go along with it. And what that does is it lets us accept a lower standard of truth, particularly as related to big data. Now, what I want to point out is that in our current situation where mankind has gotten skilled enough to be kind of responsible for our own fate, we make our own climate, for instance, gathering big data and analyzing it is our only window into our own actions. We have to be able to do it well and to be able to discern truth well in order to be competent and in order to be able to survive. And we haven't met that standard yet. With global climate change, we only knew about it early because of big computers and big data, and yet the message wasn't received well because there's this sort of idea in the air that, eh, big data, it's probably nonsense anyway, who cares? And so the scientists were vilified. A, Wiki -like, a WikiLeaks-like leak of their personal emails was poured over by conspiracy theorists, and there are many who still aren't convinced. <clears throat> Meanwhile, another piece of uh, analysis which led to the theory that all the governments of the world should enter into austerity to compensate for the degradations of the last wave of financial siren servers turned out to be based on mistaken math. And yet in that case, it took forever to get the original math revealed and it's still not widely understood that that was bad science. So in other words, with big data, people are used to the idea that they can believe what they want to believe. With old-fashioned science, I think we finally got to the point where most good-willed people in the world understood that you had to listen to the result of an experiment. We haven't gotten our culture to the point of expecting big data to be true yet, and we must get to that point. That's the, that's the greatest imperative. In the meantime, <clears throat> there's a clock ticking. As the 21st century progresses, technology will continue to get better because there's wave after wave of very bright young technologists who love this stuff, and I still love this stuff. Before too long, 3D printers will finally get good enough that you can have this thing that looks like a microwave oven that prints out your new tablet so you don't order it from Amazon anymore. <clears throat> Pretty soon, I think that same device might print out your clothes for the day. They'll fit you perfectly. You won't bother with laundry. You'll just recycle the material. Uh, you'll look great because it'll be perfect for you. <laughs> uh, the, the vehicles will drive themselves, which will be a huge blessing. My mom survived a concentration camp only to be killed in an American car accident. We're terrible drivers. The robots are already better. So that's a good thing. We should do that. But with every wave of technological improvement, if, 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 and only if, we engage in this fantasy, in this fake theater of pretending that the real people who provided the data to make it possible don't exist, if and only if we engage in that fantasy, then we will create waves of unemployment and fantastic waves of concentration of income and influence around those who run the biggest computers who run all of these new schemes. Every time technology gets better from here on out, there'll be some big computer that's the big hub for whatever it is. Whether it's self-driving cars or anything, there'll be somebody with the biggest computer so <clears throat> we have a ticking clock here. I think we have 20 or 30 years to rethink our digital economy so that we can still have dignity, we can still have formal economic benefits, we can still have markets and democracy, or <laughs> we'll enter into this other world where well, there'll be this enormous crisis of unemployment and excessive income inequality and a revolution, perhaps? Some of my lefty friends long for that moment. They long for things to get bad enough that we'll have that revolution. Every time, historically, we've gone through the transition, it's been just dreadful. I don't want to go through it again. So we should avoid it. We should fix the problem in advance. And we can. 
The birth of networking showed the way. In the book, I, I, I grope towards it. I have some suggestions. Uh, if anybody thinks I have it perfectly right, let me tell you I don't. I know for certain that this is only one step in what has to be a hard-fought empirical process to have better ideas. But as I said right at the beginning of the talk, the faith that we can learn better seems to always be rewarded. That's almost a mystical thing to me. It's a remarkable feature of this reality we find ourselves in. It's a very joyful feature. And let us choose not to give it up and not to ignore it, but instead to celebrate this aspect of our reality and fix this stupid problem. All right, thank you for listening. Uh, please just put up your hand if you have a question for Jaron Lanier. Uh, don't be intimidated. <laughs> Very provocative talk. Here we go, right here. <laughs> Hi, Jaron. I have hey. two boys uh, in grade school at the moment, and uh, this uh, intersection of technology and education is a big controversy in the schools at the moment, and I'm wondering if you have a perspective or opinion on that. Mm. There are a lot of different levels to this question. So one level is the, the sudden craze for free online courses. And this is a very painful topic for me. I mean, I have to tell you, from the birth of the internet, I was involved in trying to create free educational resources online. There used to be something called ThinkQuest, which was run out of the Internet 2 Central Engineering Office, where I was the chief scientist, blah, blah, blah. But for a while, we, had, uh, we were as popular as anything online. We were as popular as Google or, or whatever it was in those days, offering free online educational materials, which were generated by high school and college students who entered into contests for scholarships to create it. And it was beautiful. The problem I have with what's going on right now is that, unfortunately, it's another example economically of dangled free treatment that ultimately leach everybody's prospects. So uh, yeah, you can get great education in some cases, but your own prospects for becoming a paid educator in the future obviously go down in concert with it. I look at the bright kids in Tahrir Square and I say, wow, it's great they can get some free services, it's great they can get some education, but they don't have it. Twitter's not going to get them a professorship. It's not going to get them <laughs> tenure. It's not going to create economic growth. Um, it's, uh, it's once again trading informal benefits for, for formal ones, and informal is not good enough. So as much as I love making educational materials available to people, the free model ultimately concentrates wealth and power with the biggest computers instead of with those people, so it backfires. Uh, the key idea here, I think, is really not to fall into the trap of enshrining poverty. And what I mean by that is if people say, but, 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 if information cost money, you'd exclude those poor people. But why should there be poor people when technology's getting good? Screw that trade-off. The idea is to make technology affordable and to create a society without poor people. Any, any goal other than that is lowering our standards unacceptably. And that one really, really bugs me. Next question up top. Um, hi, yeah, you've gone over a lot of potential problems with our systems. I'm wondering if you have any ideas about potential solutions. Oh yeah. Well, uh, my book is Half Solutions. And let me tell you, it's a lot easier to be a cynic and talk about problems than it is to offer solutions. <laughs> so like, if you read the reviews of my book, a lot of them are like, oh, this amazing explication of how power is screwed up in our time, but then he gets to solutions. I mean, is he crazy? Um, you have to make yourself vulnerable. You have to, in order to be an empiricist, you have to put, put forth hypotheses, most of which will turn out to be wrong. And so I definitely do that in the book. It's half about proposed solutions. And it goes into a lot of detail. Uh, some of it gets a little tweaky and technical, and some of it's kind of hard, hard to understand, honestly. But yeah, I go there. I'm not going to do it right now. Uh, it's honestly a little tedious in places. I find it fascinating. I'm working with various economists and, uh, and uh, mathematicians to collaborate on models of some of the ideas I'm proposing so we can at least study them in simulation. Um, the key thing is to accept the vulnerability that you might be wrong if you put forward an idea. Uh, 
It's very, very easy to fall into one pocket or the other of either saying, I'm going to be the invulnerable critic, I'm the smart guy who sees what's screwed up about everything, you know, and then you go, that's one pocket that's useless. And then another pocket that's useless is, I know exactly the right way, free and open software, whatever your ideology is, Ayn Rand and perfect markets, or uh, if we could just only talk to each other with social media, politics would become perfected and we could just have socialism, we wouldn't have to worry about money anymore. We could get, like anybody who believes they have a perfect system is wrong, you know? <laughs> that's just, that's, that's the nature of complicated problems. So the key is to not fall into either of those um, failure modes, as we say, but instead to make yourself vulnerable and to put out contingent ideas for solutions, test them and keep on incrementally improving them. Um, that to accept that vulnerability is to have the courage that can create progress. Next question. The next question is right here in the middle. Thank you. Um, well, this is the Jewish Community Center. Uh, um, about 3,000 years ago, uh, it was written that uh, the devil. Uh, tempted our, our ancestors in, with the ability to become gods. And uh, at the time, it looked like a complete lie for the last 3,000 years. But now, it's looking like this promise, so to speak, is uh, happening, that immortality is a possibility. And the ability to create something out of nothing is a possibility. So I wondered if you would. Uh, answer uh, if, you, if you would um, deal with that issue. Oh yeah, that was a nice light question. Um, well, you know, I actually do have chapters in the book on ancient ideas about money and God. Uh, in my view, um, money is in part functional because it forgets the people who used to hold it, so it lets blood enemies collaborate. In a sense, people are even more clannish than they are greedy. It's a weird thing. So uh, you can use greed to uh, overwrite the clannishness that people will otherwise use to tear each other apart. So in a sense, um, what the invention of money and God, which, well, I, without getting into theological discussion, money and God and human awareness are approximately as old. They're approximate contemporaries. And God essentially remembers all the information that money forgets. Uh, what, what the system does is it, is it breaks memory into two pieces and, and God keeps these moral books, these other books that are forgotten by cash and by um, debt contracts and so forth. And um, I think it's a really interesting uh, system and there's a lot to be said for it. Um, so yeah, I talk about it a lot in the book. I feel like maybe right now I won't go into that whole thing, but there's a lot of stuff on the ancient world. Uh, there's also a lot of Aristotle in the book and all, all sorts of things, a lot of Homer. Next question up top. I'm a little unclear exactly on what you meant by uh, how critical it is for big data uh, to get more true. And um, we'd say that one to get what? Uh, how, when you mentioned that it's critical for big data to become more true or to get more true. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you could elaborate that a little bit, um, maybe from the macro side. Do you mean society as a whole, kind of as a coefficient to truth, has to get get better? Or? Mm, okay. Well, we have a truth problem in modernity. Um, on the internet, you can live in a little bubble in which uh, there were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark, and I don't know. You can you can live in all these bubbles that are counter to what we can study empirically. And uh, it's always been possi possible for people to believe nonsense, but I don't think um, it's been as easy as, as it is now for educated people and modern people to believe nonsense for, for a while. I think it's gotten a little worse. But the bigger problem is that the idea of big data as a source of truth isn't widely established in the culture. And, and I think there are a lot of reasons for this. One is that in the sciences, we don't have standardized practices yet. So for instance, to do medical research, 
there's a whole set of techniques that researchers have to use to make sure they're not fooling themselves. And these include placebos and double blind studies and, all, and uh, peer review. There, there, there are all these techniques that, that have been established. Uh, and every time there's a technique like that, it's because in the past people really screwed up, right? You know, so there's always pain behind every rule. And in the case of big data, we haven't established what the corresponding rigor means. We don't, we don't have rules for the custody of big data or replicated testing of it or all kinds of, it's all very ad hoc right now. And so in the sciences, it exists in this kind of murky half light. And in the popular culture, our experience of it is that it's nonsense. You know, like I said, it's a confidence game. And we have to establish both the formal and the broader pop culture basis for learning to trust big data realistically to survive. That's the only point I'm making. Next question's here to your left. Hi. Hi, Jaron. Um, I last spent an afternoon with you in the year 2000 in Red Burns' class at ITP, and you were great then. And I've been thinking about you since then. Um, you mentioned that um, the alternative that people give you is that things would be a lot worse. And we don't know if that's true. And you also say that revolutions are really dreadful. And that's true, and we want to avoid one. Um, you talk in Salon recently about how our country has turned into a gigantic plutocracy. That sounds like a revolution that we're going through right now. Am I wrong? Is that not a revolution that this is, we're happening and we're existing in this revolution as we speak? Um, well, the creation of an oligarchy or a plutocracy, I guess you could call that a coup. A revolution usually refers to going in the other direction where there's some mass of people who sort of storm the Bastille or something. And that's not what's going on right now. Um, I, and I don't want to see it. I, don't, I think those are violent, horrible things when they happen, you know. Uh, I'd rather s solve the problem if it's possible, and I think people of goodwill can do it. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, and I can't, I can't, I don't know what, I, what the salon thing says, so I can't refer to that, but uh, I, um, I think we have to, uh, part of what, what the problem is, is learning to outgrow our relationship to romantic ideas. You know, I'll, I'll, here, let me draw another metaphor. Um, I think in America in particular, we're very drawn to the romance of the West, to this um, lawless place where the land was free, just like information. But weirdly enough, you had to go through somebody's monopolized railroad to get to your free land. <laughs> and weirdly enough, the Native Americans were displaced or just, in the case of the Bay Area, exterminated to make your land available. And, and that, there's an incredible romance about that. And I actually grew up at the t in the tail end of it in southern New Mexico in a place where people were still wandering around with rifles on horses and shooting each other once in a while on dirt roads. I, I remember that world. Um, and there's a little bit of a loss of ramp romance in entering into a different world. Um, and the difference is a really interesting difference. I think a more sustainable, mature world, and perhaps a slightly less romantic world, is one in which there's a preponderance of people in the middle of, of how their lives turn out. We can call them a middle class, and that, that that middle hump can outspend the elite tip. And when you can get to that point, it's, it's interesting, because a lot of my friends, when I say, oh, I want to promote the middle class and the future of the middle class, and they'll say, middle class, ew. The middle class is that bourgeois thing that the parents represent, and rock and roll and alt culture and everything is against the middle class. How can you be talking about the middle class? And it is kind of true that a, a sort of a sane, stable world where the middle can outspend the tip does lose a touch of romance. I think there's a bit of trade-off, and I kind of mourn it, but I don't know any way around it. Um, a west of real estate and, and, and all the things we live in in the Bay Area is actually a better world than the old west of the gunslingers. Um, it's, that one only looks good in the movies. And essentially, that, that um, getting into that transition, sort of a form of growing up, is painful. Next question up top. Two more questions and then a little more music. Okay. Hi, Jared. Uh, romanticism is probably a good place to start. I'm interested in the way, in a, the possibility of a two-way, a public database of two-way public hyperlinks in the way that Ted Nelson might have meant it. I'm wondering if, if you see that as possible or are we locked into a world of these unidirectional uh, links with information asymmetry? Uh, so if I could borrow your information, what might this public database look like with these uh, two-way links? 
And uh, what are the steps to get there? What should we be building? How can we be working together to make that happen? Mm. Well, the early network designs did have two-way links. It was, it, we really lost two-way links in part in the 70s uh, in terms of the fundamental structure of the internet became, it became possible to ignore, the, to ignore the backlink. And then with Tim Berners-Lee and HTML, we really rejected it. But the thing is, you need two-way links to, to kind of calculate anything about what's going on on the net. So uh, what Google does is it scrapes the whole internet to reconstruct the backlinks that are lost, right? And then it keeps those in a dungeon that's never been cracked by a hacker, because that's the really valuable stuff. So it's, it's really a strange thing. By rejecting the backlinks, we created these opportunities for gigantic spying services that would have big enough computers to reconstruct them. Facebook is similar. I mean, it, if there had been two-way links in the web, you'd always know who was pointing at your site. And as a matter of course, you'd meet people who share interests and all that. But because we don't have that, Facebook has to uh, recreate it. And it's, an, it's a different kind of a scheme than Google's, because it has to get everybody into its own sort of sub-web where it does have two-way links, right? So you can just look at Google's dungeon or Facebook's network and you see what two-way links look like. It's nothing exotic or weird. It's, there's, no, there's no mystery about it. There's nothing scary about it. It's perfectly ordinary. Next question's up here in the middle. Um, I'm concerned about, like you, the um, free music, free journalism, free everything. And um, you mentioned universal micropayments instead of having silos, individual silos. How is this going to work? Mm, OK. Well, I go into this in the book quite a bit. So the way it would work is different from previous market economies. And it, uh, so, so far, when you've been uh, a citizen in, in, a, in a world of markets and capitalism, you make money rarely. Like you get a salary check every two weeks or something like that, or you get uh, you get a royalty check once in a while or whatever it is, and then you spend money constantly every time you get an espresso or, or pay for parking or whatever it is. So you make money less frequently than you spend money. In this world, you'd constantly be getting little drabs of money. It would be, uh, the, 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 the act of earning would be this very gradual process. And uh, because of the magic of markets, instead of it being a zero-sum system where you know, just it concentrates wealth for a few and other people do badly. The idea is that the whole thing would grow, and I believe it would, and I think I make an effective argument for that, so that more people would do better as a result of this constant interchange of money than if the money weren't present and if it were just a barter system or a reputation system. And so what it would look like is kind of like this constant little ticker of money coming in and money going out, and uh, people would find that the data they provide to the networks varies greatly from individual to individual. Some people might be active designers who are designing guitars for somebody to print out just for one gig, never to be seen again. Other people would be translators, as I mentioned, or many other examples. What we see in social networking is that people, so there's an interesting thing. If you look at online systems that are a spoken hub system, like users of YouTube or the Apple Store or the Amazon Store, the people who do well in those environments form themselves into a winner-take-all curve, where you have a huge emaciated long tail and a thin neck, and then a tiny tower that's sort of a token tower of winners. And as I pointed out, the winners aren't even necessarily winning that much. But when you have a thickly connected net, like on, on Facebook, where all the backlinks exist, and it doesn't go through a single hub, and people connect directly with each other, you start to see the average person being interested in a fairly large number of people rather than just a few stars. And if that were monetized, weirdly, if Facebook were monetized, it would create a middle class. How about that? Isn't that amazing? And so <laughs> instead of the 20th century way of supporting a middle class through special little ratcheted ad hoc solutions like unions or tenure or taxi medallions or whatever it is, we might get one naturally out of just the way people use each other's information in a thickly connected network. Does any of that make sense? It gets a little bit tweaky and technical. Um, and I want to emphasize it's all contingent on testing, so I don't, I don't claim to know for certain that this is right. But I think we have at least the opening of a picture that's legitimately explorable. So now we have a rare treat, as I said. Robert Dick, a friend of Jaren's, is here tonight. By the way, he has two concerts coming up Saturday, May 18th at Trinity Chapel on Dana Street in Berkeley. 
And now, Robert, come on up, and Robert and Jaron are going to treat us to some music. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to introduce Robert a tiny bit more. Um, Robert is uh, probably known as the foremost advanced technique flautist in the world. He's a, probably the most influential modern flute player. And he's going to be playing on a flute with, of his own design where the head joints slide so he can do slide notes. And I'm going to be playing a little Celtic s string instrument that's much more conventional in this case. Don't forget, Jaron Lanier will sign books in the atrium. Thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And we'll go out this way. Thank you. <laughs>